The fastest way to the heart of a country is through its food. And street food is the bullet train to the most authentic and delicious discovery. International street foods run the gamut from gourmet. It's got a super splendid ocean flavor to it. Too adventurous. I love worms. It's a bamboo worm. Indulging in street foods is like learning a new language. After a good night drinking with your friends, you've got to eat a broodjes out flesh. Mm. And once you try it, there's no going back. It gives you a bit of a kick. And it's quite addictive. So forget the restaurant menu. And lace up those walking shoes for the best, cheapest, and most fascinating eats on the streets around the world. Hi. Food. It's the number one reason people like to travel, and the best place to find it is on the streets. There's no better place to rub elbows with the locals and grab a bite that's fast, inexpensive, and speaks volumes about the culture. From Mopani worms in Namibia to hot dogs and pretzels in New York. Street foods reflect the essence of a place. Scoop up a camel spleen sandwich in Morocco and you're digging into a piece of Berber history. Bite into spicy rabbit heads in China. And you're overwhelmed by the Sichuan tradition of spicy and bold flavors. They're mouth-watering, portable, and cheap. Like the best jerk chicken you'll ever eat. From a stand in Kingston, Jamaica for a couple of bucks. Vendors are magicians with just a cart, a grill, and a few fresh cuts of meat and spices. While food trucks are revving up in the United States, Street foods have been around for centuries throughout the rest of the world. So we travel across the globe to Jerusalem for snacks as old as the Bible, to Berlin and Amsterdam for sweet and savory flavors from Europe, and to Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Mumbai, dishing up everything from eel kebabs to stinky tofu. And we start in Mumbai, India. It's the largest open-air kitchen in the world. Sizzling hot, crazy loud, fast and always cheap capable of serving get this more than 20 million people a day mumbai is india's most populous city a magnet for people and foods from all over the country you'll get a taste of every part of india at on the streets of mumbai you won't get that anywhere else kalyan karmakar is a market researcher but his passion is blogging about street food of his native india Warm temperatures and dirt cheap food carts bring practically everyone outdoors to socialize and eat at the numerous cow gullies, which means eat streets. And like this cow gully in the Fort Commercial District, there are always stands noisily cooking up pow bhaji. Pow bhaji is a cross between vegetable stew and gravy served with hot buttered rolls. The base starts with potatoes hand mashed in butter, along with diced tomatoes, onions, peas, and peppers. And then he's going to add his red masala and then uh, spices and then a touch of lime. It originated to feed textile mill workers in the 1890s. So in India, we don't use spoons all the time. We use like our breads, our hands. It's really delicious. Sir. For me, it's really all about the butter. The price is easy to swallow too. Just one dollar for a plateful. A lot of the food in Mumbai is vegetarian because 80% of the population is Hindu. They consider cows to be sacred. But they do have their burgers. Bombay burgers, that is. Otherwise known as vada pa. We call it vada pa. For you, it's Bombay burger. Ah, Mumbai's favorite food. It has no meat. It's just a carb fest of potatoes and spices mashed in a ball, coated with chickpea flour and deep fried. The vada pav sells for about 10 cents. Locals eat it for every meal. If you want to taste real Mumbai food, it's on the streets, available on the streets. Yeah. No need to go to a five star or any posh restaurant. Well, maybe, but it's better if you're weaned on a very spicy diet. The Bombay burgers come with complimentary chili peppers, which would destroy adventurous eaters in most parts of the world. But not here. No, 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 because we've grown up on this. So, you know, after this, like habanero peppers of Mexico, those are like kids stuff. Like, we can have that in our sleep. No doubt about it, the street food scene in Mumbai is gritty. 
Takeout is wrapped in newspaper. Everyone cooks, serves, and eats with their right hand. And sanitation issues make the tap water unsafe to drink, especially for Westerners. It's why most visitors pass up raw fruits, vegetables, and drinks. While there are eat streets all over Mumbai, you'll only find meat dishes in a handful of Muslim areas, like Bendi Bazaar in the oldest part of South Mumbai. It's home to the Borhi Mahala neighborhood, with dozens of stands and holes in the wall where rich and poor rub elbows and break bread. Starting with the famous Indian flatbread called roti. Here at the Mohammed Khan Bakery, the process hasn't changed in hundreds of years. Whole wheat flour, water, and a pinch of salt. Hand kneaded, flattened on a cloth covered bowl, and then slapped inside a clay tandoor oven. Now even the aroma, it just makes you smile. I mean, this is like what bread was meant to be. They ship rotis all over India. And just down the block to this shop, cooking barahandi, or 12 vessels. Nahim Hyatt's family has owned this place for three generations, where they've got cow, goat, and lamb feet, rumps, brains, and bone marrow, simmering in curries and sauces all day. It takes 12 hours to get cooked. We put up the recipe in the morning, then we arrange it in the evening. Kalyan is joined by Mr. Mosin. He's, you know, one of the regulars here. And now we are going to start and we'll let you know how it is. So, so it's got, it's chota ka paya, and paya means trotters. Trotters. And paya means trotters. That's goat feet to you and me. This is just the marrow. You, you, we suck out the marrow out of bones, but they've done it for us. So you've just got this, like, marrow over here, and, and, and you, you dip your roti into it, take it out. This is to be eaten with our hands, not with a knife or yeah, a fork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we sort of that dunk in. it in. Yeah. So let's do that. Wait. Mm. Lot of such food. I love it. You've got a meaty flavor, so it's very, very decadent and, and sinful. And the slow cooking makes the meat literally melt off the bone even a tailbone. Look at this, I mean, it's, it's like one of Mr. Mohsen's mattresses. I mean, like, it's, it's like softer than a feather mattress. Fantastic. Mm, good. There aren't many places like this left as younger consumers want faster foods. But for lots of Mumbikers, the most popular spots for street foods and socializing are Mumbai's beaches. It's what life was before malls were developed. So it's, it's really the malls for most of Mumbai. And here at Juhu Beach, people come for the cool breezes and the chops, or snacks. These are made of puri, fried flour dough, some flat, some formed into hollow balls. All topped with variations of potatoes, chutney relishes, and spices. It's a little bit spicy, but it's a tasty food. It's a mix up of the, all the vegetables, tomato, onion, and all. So it's uh, very yummy. The variations are as endless as the streams of locals and tourists walking along the sand. Yeah, I'm not too good with spice, so I have to try and find things that aren't too hot. This isn't too hot, so it's good. I like skewers and stuff off the stick, they're beautiful. But yeah, a lot of veggies as well. It's good. And desserts as well. There's a lot of excellent desserts. Desserts, like the gola, crushed ice, doused with several different flavors of tart and sticky syrup. There's just no neat way to eat these things. Or a faluta. You can get them in different sweet flavors. This one is rose, mixed with noodles, seeds, milk, and ice cream. Hard to tell whether to use a straw or a fork. And to top off a night at Juhu Beach, there are ponds, a beetle leaf stuffed with dried fruits and spices. And it's a digestive and a slight, uh, it gives you a bit of a kick. And if the mildly addicting stimulant in the beetle leaves isn't enough of a kick for you, get this. They dress them with a thin layer of real silver, just for show. But you don't need silver to eat like a king in Mumbai. Because the street food is so incredibly cheap and delicious. I love Mumbai. I'm, I'm addicted to Mumbai. It's a bit like Hotel California. Once you check in, you, you just can't check out. And while it is tempting to linger in India, why miss out on one of the most delectable combinations of sugar and butter you'll ever find? They're very good. This diet buster is coming up later in Amsterdam. But first, it's time to pack on the protein. And in Bangkok, it either slithers, scurries, or squirms. I love worms. It's a bamboo worm. Oh my god, I want to taste it. 
Bangkok, Thailand is one of the fastest growing, most modern cities in Southeast Asia. With a population topping 9 million and counting, it's a city that never sleeps while it pulsates with culture, fashion, and cuisine peddled by immigrants from around the region. So it's a constant outdoor smorgasbord along the canals and streets with vendors hawking everything from crispy grasshoppers and locusts to fermented rice and spicy snakehead fish. Not only like fast, it have to be good. So all the street food squeeze itself into people's daily life. It's not only street food, it's a part of life. Nim Korokok is a travel and food writer who can't wait to get home to Bangkok after business trips. And I'm just falling in love with food because what Thai people love so much, I'm just ordinary Thai, we love food. <laughs> they love food so much, locals eat multiple small meals all day and all night. It's always a party on the streets. Starting with seafood sold from boats along the canals that crisscross Bangkok. Here at the Tailing Chan Floating Market, sellers paddle up with fresh fish, portable grills, and spicy fixings all on their boats. This is absolutely the best place to find the food in a very unusual atmosphere. Today's catch, prawns, mussels, and snakehead fish with traditional Thai sauce that combines sour, sweet, salty, and spicy tastes. And for a finishing touch, homegrown basil leaves. And the Thai know how to cook with heat. So good! <laughs> Spicy! <laughs> but if you're from, say, Italy, it may be more excitement than your mouth can handle. Yeah, very spicy. Everything is, is very spicy. We are not used to spicy food. But this British couple says they'd rather eat papaya salad and pork satay here than at any restaurant. And why not? when this meal costs less than three dollars. Oh, you can't beat the street food. It's just, it's cheap, it's authentic, it's tasty. I mean, the seafood just comes from the That's water. Delicious. It's just amazing. <laughs> Live like a king here for no money at all. Delicious. <laughs> Vendors near the Royal Palace sell fermented rice and lotus leaves, coconut ice cream, and coconut milk served in the source. Very fresh, very good. Yes, yes. Coconut, coconut! Thailand is one of the world's top coconut growers, and they use it in a lot of native dishes, including their favorite curry dishes. Meat and veggie curries are street stand staples all around Bangkok. You can see 20 different varieties at the Nong Leong Market, where downtown workers come for a fast, hot lunch. And what's cooking for dessert here? Steamed rice crepes. Stuffed with pork, minced with peanuts and shallots. Or saku saimu. Same filling with a sweet tapioca coating. When we talk about people, Thai people, Bangkok people, they all make a joke about us that we eat like five meals a day. Which is not true because we eat seven meals a day. <laughs> At night, Bangkok's eat streets are hopping. This is Silam Road. It's like a melting pot where people come from anywhere in the world and then they live in Bangkok. What they bring with them is not the suitcase, they bring the food. So there's shawarma from the Middle East and noodles with barbecue pork and crab from China. The late night and backpacker crowds also flock to this street food haven along Khao San Road where immigrant cuisine is hot stuff like Indian rotis cooked with banana, condensed milk, and chocolate for dessert. Let's get sugar high. <laughs> and mangoes are served with sticky rice, sweetened with coconut. And it wouldn't be Thailand without Pad Thai. But this iconic dish is cooked in several different ways down to the choice of four kinds of noodles. This close to the sea, shrimp is a popular version. It's cheap and it's safe and it's really nice. But here's where it gets interesting. Yes, we've saved the best for last. Crunchy, spicy, crispy bugs. I love worms. It's a bamboo worm 
frying bugs and selling them has been a calling for Mono Parnathan for 20 years, bringing a taste of home from northeastern Thailand to the big city. Locusts, grasshoppers, bamboo worms, scorpions. For Thais, they are a major source of protein. But for tourists, the grasshoppers and other creepy crawlies are a test of bravery. It's like chicken. Especially this giant water beetle. I'm scared. Also, it made me proud. Yeah, it's kind of like a nice snack, I think. It's <laughs> ridiculous. How is it? <laughs> and how about a baby frog chaser with a spritz of soy sauce? Easy. Good, good. Like a chicken, yeah. Yeah, like a um, thin chicken. Yeah. <laughs> this tough guy orders one locust. But gets more than he bargained for. Yeah, for 20 baht, you get a whole bag of loads. That's about 65 cents for the family pack. It's very salty and crunchy, which I thought they'd be sweet locusts. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a little disappointed, but it's not actually terrible if you don't think about it too much. But it's impossible not to think about what you're biting into in Hong Kong, where your nose keeps reminding you. I smell dead people. That's what's coming out of this bag. That's coming up later. But first, it's back to the future in Germany, where you find an ingenious cross between the Jetsons and age-old tradition. It's the best I've ever eaten. Visitors to Germany come to savor the old world charm or stop at milestones of history, like the site of the shattered Berlin Wall. Restaurants are usually expensive, and you don't hear much about the street food. But you can find cheap eats at a nearby imbiss, which means food stand in German. You'll find them all over the outdoor weekend markets in Berlin, like the Winterplatz. Vendors dish up plenty of German favorites, like soups, strudels, and pickled fish. But ask any Berliner, and they'll tell you the best is worst. Bratwurst. Commuters get them hot and on the go at metro stations from the sellers who look like something out of Star Wars. Very good, Jack. Right? Mm -hmm. here is the best yeah. gift in painting. They're called grill walkers. One man sausage band strapped into a combo propane tank and grill contraption. Yeah. Now, this is mobile food. Wow. But the most beloved brat in Berlin is the curry worst. Pork sausages grilled and doused in curry and tomato sauce. And one of the most famous currywurst joints is Curry 36, where you can eat inside or out. But most currywurst is grab and go. I asked them where you can get the best currywurst in Berlin, and they told me Curry 36. And so I'm here now to taste, and it's great. Urban legend has it that in 1949, a German housewife traded liquor to British soldiers for the hard-to-find curry spices. She cooked up the cheap but filling dish. This meal deal is less than four bucks. Oh yeah, really good. Over the years, Germans have acquired a taste for Mediterranean fare brought by Turkish immigrants like this modest guy. Come to Mustafa's Kreuzberg, Berlin City. This is best kebab in town. Donner kebabs are like heroes, an oversized sandwich made of pressed spiced chicken, veal, or lamb, sliced paper thin, and piled high with veggies in a pita, all for about $4. I love kebab, yeah? Before, uh, I don't found a good kebab, and I think I must make the best. Food writer Steen Hansen agrees. Got lovely meat here, we got some feta cheese, onions, salad, some pieces of potato. Just delicious. And if you're on the hunt for another European street food adventure, head west to the Netherlands. Amsterdam is known as the Venice of the North because of its canals and seafood. We eat the shrimps, we eat the eel, we eat herring. Boy, do they eat their herring. <laughs> Dutch foodie Francis Bruckhausen gets his fix at Doppermarkt Street Market. Raw herring is salted for several days and sliced into bite-sized pieces with raw onion and pickled gherkins thrown in. They leave the pancreas inside, so the enzymes, they make the flesh really soft. Oh. It's good. Delicious. Cod is another favorite Dutch street food. In a batter with a lot of spices and herbs. 
And just like in Germany, Amsterdam's large immigrant population is mixing it up. It's a lot of influence of different cultures. So we have Suriname people, Moroccan, Turkish. Immigrants who cook up dishes like baga, which are donuts made of chickpea flour. Or these sandwiches, they're called... Uh, broodje zoutvlees. This is uh, fiery stuff. Sticky, gooey, hot. They are stuffed with spicy, fatty, cured beef. Brought by immigrants from Suriname. Look at this. Animal fat. <laughs> All over Amsterdam, you'll find snack kiosks popular with tourists and the drinking crowd. Like the carb-loaded street foods across the canals in the Albert Cup Mart. Bet these fries smothered in mayo can cure a hangover. Yeah, mayonnaise, baby. Um, oh, my goodness. Folks also flock to outdoor markets to avoid the pricey restaurants even if some of the street eats are a mystery. Still not quite sure what kind of meat this is, but it's, it's delicious. Less adventurous tourists head straight for the famous Dutch sweet stands. This you can find all over Holland. The Stroopwafel. Stroopwafels are a Netherlands creation dating back to the 1700s. Two paper-thin cookies with sweet caramel honey slathered in the middle. This one is a secret family recipe. My father he was busy uh, getting the, the perfect recipe for many years. And finally, he got it. Very good. It's awesome. Very sweet, warm, tasty, rich. Mm. And the other uniquely Dutch street food dessert starts with a similar sweet batter, but with different results. These are called proffer chess, which means to puff up. <laughs> Miniature puff pancakes. His grandfather used to hawk the mini pancakes at traveling carnivals. Uh, flour, milk, eggs, and some secret in ingredients where I can talk about. Before. Okay, I can understand. Yet another Dutch Great. health food, served hot and topped with powdered sugar and butter. <laughs> Lots of butter. They're very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. From artery-clogging goodness in Amsterdam to a bitter dessert in Hong Kong, Coming up next, turtle jelly. It's just what the doctor ordered. It's usually sexual potency for guys or beauty for women. <laughs> and then, practicing proper etiquette in Japan can be very hard to swallow. This is definitely a big oyster. Hong Kong is home to cuisines from all over the world. Street foods are no exception. And here in this hip and fashionable city, they are served with a heaping helping of tradition. So you'll find skewers of pig intestines, turtle jelly, and the most misunderstood, most reviled street food ever. This might be the, the worst thing I've ever taken a bite of. <laughs> it's all good for Amy Ma, food writer for the Wall Street Journal and other publications. Whenever you're hungry, you always find a cart. And the best thing about it is that you can walk down a street and treat that street like you would a five-course a la carte menu, only you're going from place to place and, and not sitting down at one restaurant. And it starts with breakfast in Jardine's Bazaar, with the Chinese version of a donut. But inside the fried dough is shredded fried pork, pickled vegetables, and rice. The rice ball donuts are served with warm soy milk mixed with more fried dough. It's like a bread pudding soup that's less sweet and better for you. <laughs> this would be like your ham and eggs and hash brown combination equivalent here in Hong Kong. The combo costs about $1.50, and it has the typical blend of savory and sweet, yin and yang. Very good. Of course, tea is very big in Hong Kong culture, both cold and hot. Especially the very strong, very old silk stocking tea, which gets its name from the stocking used to strain the tea over and over again. Not to worry, the stockings haven't been worn, but the tea packs a punch, which is why it comes with lots of condensed milk and sugar. Wow! One of the most beloved street snacks in Hong Kong is the egg or custard tart. With just a hint of sweetness, they're habit-forming. It's kind of like a flan creme brulee 
and the best pie crust you can think of all rolled into one. People argue about whether the British or Portuguese introduced egg tarts to Hong Kong. But this treat is pure Chinese. They call it a thousand year pastry because inside the flaky crust is a gooey black egg preserved for months in a mixture of clay, ash, and lime. Then it's coated with sweet bean paste and ginger. So preserved eggs and ginger are a classic combination. It's like peanut butter and jelly. It has a gelatin-like texture to it. So it's almost like a gummy bear inside. The Chinese make up 90% of Hong Kong's population. In the Mongkok district of Kowloon, there are lots of sidewalk cafes serving noodles and dumplings with plenty of internal organs. You get a lot of great street food stalls that will be a little more authentic. You'll start to see pig intestines or things that, you know, might make the typical tourists a little squeamish. You'll see that all the time in Hong Kong. Things like squid tentacles, spicy beef stomach, and yes, pig intestines on a skewer. They may be local favorites, but tourists find them tough to chew and even harder to swallow. Right. It smells like sulfur, yes it does. Which kind of smells like poop, which is exactly what it is. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm not making out with anyone tonight. <laughs> you can cleanse your palate and more with traditional medicines. They play a big role in what the Chinese eat, which explains why this very bitter turtle jelly is so popular here. It's like a funky coffee jello. With medicinal foods in Asia, it's usually sexual potency for guys or beauty for women. So it's this very primitive idea of what good health is. <laughs> turtle shells are broken into little bits and stewed for about nine hours. When it cools, the thick collagen in the shell turns to jelly. It takes a liberal dose of sugar syrup to make this medicine go down. But the real test of just how far you're willing to go for authentic Hong Kong street food begins long before you lay your eyes on it. It's called stinky tofu. The smell is horrible. And just one whiff is enough to send tourists running the other way. Oh. Try a little bit. Oh. No. It's actually really rare to find these on the streets these days. A lot of the stands have been outlawed because it just smells so bad. This tofu soaks in rotting vegetable matter for several months. And then it's fried and served with a dribble of hoisin sauce. Dead people in my mouth right now. And seriously, most tourists won't go near it. It's really not that bad. But a couple of our crew members were willing to taste one for the team. <laughs> That's, That's horrible. horrible. You just can't breathe while you're doing it. Yeah. And that's the adventure of eating street food in Hong Kong. Now some foods just can't cross the cultural divide, but that's all part of the fun. Coming up next in Tokyo, it's all about freshness and technique, where minding your manners can be one hot proposition. Then, an age-old ingredient in Jerusalem cures everything from aches and pains to wrinkles. Eating in Japan is all about art and etiquette, down to the smallest of street food stands and the grittiest of neighborhoods. Like the stalls around the Skiji Fish Market in Tokyo, where everything is immaculate and fresh. Yes, Skiji Fish Market is the most famous and biggest fish market in the world. Here you'll find every kind of fish and seafood imaginable. Much of it served raw. The sushi is definitely the freshest in the world. Yasuhisa Chiba, a culinary student whose family is in the seafood business, says it's that obsession with freshness that sets Japanese street food apart. Like this rice bowl, loaded with raw fish for about $15, about a third of a restaurant price. This is a donburi, or a sashimi over rice. Very popular around here because everything is in one place. It's very rustic, easy to eat, and uh, inexpensive, but super good. Uh, this squid is looking absolutely delicious. Mm. So is the raw tuna and whole shrimp. The uninitiated only eat the tail. Those in the know also go for the head. Brains, it's what's for lunch. <laughs> got a really hearty umami flavor, nice and rich, not too salty, not fishy at all. You hear the word umami a lot in Tokyo, 
It's used to describe a savory, earthy taste. Here at the Skiji Fish Market in Tokyo, it's a point of pride to handle raw fish as little as possible because heat from a person's hand can spoil it. Yes, Japanese people love healthy food. Uh, they like simple preparations that don't uh, mess with the product at all. This is about as basic as it comes. Unagi, or freshwater eel, grilled to perfection. In the summer, it's very popular to eat because uh, it gives you strength and stamina. Mm. Unagi has great fat content to it. It's real moist, real rich. It's basted in a subtle mixture of soy sauce, sugar, and mirin, which is a sweet sake. There's nothing subtle about the stand next door selling giant raw oysters. Look how huge that is. Protocol dictates you've got to swallow it whole, no matter how big it is. And this is definitely a big oyster. <laughs> Quite literally, a mouthful of ocean flavor. First thing was salt. Mm. And the really meaty, super good. Another popular street food is much easier to swallow. It's ramen soup with lots of noodles and broth. You have to slurp. I know it's very rude in America to slurp your noodles or pasta, but in Japan you have to do it for it to be delicious. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. There are a lot of rules you need to know when eating in Japan, like how to bow to your server, how to add wasabi, when to pick up food with your fingers, and yes, the right way to slurp soup. Slurping helps you breathe in the aroma. The Japanese experience food with all of their senses. Like the way they eat takoyaki or octopus balls. At this stand in the Amiyoko district, a no-frills outdoor market full of food stalls. To be clear, these are not octopus testicles. They are octopus tentacles, chunked into a pancake-type batter. They're topped with dried fish flakes, seaweed, and smothered in mayonnaise. The rule is to devour them straight from the fire. It's like eating hot lava. Not an overwhelming octopusy taste. It's a lot of hot batter and the nice sauce that's on there. Tokyo is not like Mumbai or Bangkok, which have food stands all over. Here, you have to know where to look, like the Asakusa district. The street leading up to the oldest Buddhist temple in the city is lined with old-time vendors, serving up traditional treats, like marinated seaweed. It's not overly salty, it's not overly powerful, it's just got that nice umami flavor, and it's very healthy, you can tell, but it's delicious. Now, this guy spends hours scraping the kelp and soaking it in vinegar. This just might be an acquired taste, according to these Australians. I think it'd be interesting in soup or in insects rather than just by itself. Though they love their seaweeds and creatures, the Japanese could not survive without rice. We use rice for everything. It used to be used as currency, and uh, not only do we eat it for every single meal, it's used to make sake, shochu, desserts. Desserts like these, kibidango. They're balls of sticky rice pounded and coated with sweet bean powder. They're sembe, a dry, crunchy rice cracker. This one is a wasabi seaweed flavor. It's cool to watch how they grill them in the back. And this woman transforms rice crackers into something you'd swear was meat, just by soaking and spicing it. If you told me that it was a, a beef intestine or a tripe, I, I might believe it. Nope, it's really rice crackers. And after a long day of eating, it's sake time. Which, by the way, is also made of rice. After dark, the working crowd heads here. Yakitori Alley, under the downtown train tracks. Yakitori are bite-sized pieces grilled on small skewers. Two skewers cost less than four bucks. Right now I'm gonna try some livers and uh, the rear end of the chicken. There's been a head-to-tail trend in Japan for centuries, and they're always scrupulous about food safety and cleanliness. Just from hearing its tail, you might think it's disgusting, but this is really good. 
or stick your skewers into these morsels. Pig's head, chicken thigh, heart, or cartilage. It's a fatty, a little bit fatty taste. It's not totally, in, it's not unpleasant at all, actually. It seems to be quite crunchy and crispy. It's good, actually. Never thought I'd eat it, but I'm eating it. The heart is excellent as well. It's really, really is good. Jolly, nice and splendid. Minimal cooking, minimal interruption from the chef. So whether it's cooked simply or simply not cooked, Tokyo Street Food is calling you like a sidewalk samurai with your chopsticks and skewers. Come pie! Coming up next, one of the oldest cities in the world dishes out street fare that just might hold the secret to world peace. My mouth, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Jerusalem is one of the oldest cities in the world. It's the crossroads of religious and cultural tradition from Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. Its tumultuous history can be felt in every narrow street and alley. Even its street foods take you back to another time, with origins from many other countries, especially those sold at the Mahana Yehuda market in the center of town. And in the middle of the market, is Uzi Eli Hazy. He's known simply as the juice guy. Really, he's more like a medicine man. This one is ginger with apple, in case if you are diseased or upset stomach. Israel grows a lot of fruits, so juice stands are everywhere, but none quite like this. Uzi Eli brews a concoction to cure every ailment. Almonds. Dates, Dates. Oh, no. it right. makes you wake up All and right. uh, full of minerals and vitamins. Pomegranate, apple, and cayenne. All right. Make the blood to run much better. We have the, the bitterness and the citrus of the pomegranate and then the spiciness of the cayenne pepper. But his most prized potions are made from one of the world's oldest fruits. It's known as etrog in Hebrew or citron in English. What you see here is especially unique in the world. Eight centuries ago, a famous Jewish philosopher proclaimed the etrog to have 70 healing properties. Right. It's for pregnancy, right. for heart, for pressure, for wake up. So Uzi Eli puts it in almost everything from juice to anti-wrinkle cream to this, his own age-reversing spray. <laughs> Close your eyes. Once a day, wait, 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 you'll be become more beautiful, boy. Open your mouth, open your mouth, open. He invents some of the elixirs himself. Others are passed down from his Yemenite grandfather. They prepare and heal all the system in your body. Chaim. Just like the Etro, many of the foods sold in this open-air market are as old as the Bible. It's a uh, large open-air market, and you have vendors with your classic spices, olives, and your fresh produce and fruits, as well as meat and, and fish. Ben Brewer is an amateur chef and runs Israel food tours in Jerusalem. Christians here and, and Muslims and Jews that have come from uh, North Africa or Iraq or Eastern Europe or the United States, and they all bring their own uh, culinary traditions. And all their traditions together have helped create the, the Israeli cuisine. And that cuisine all starts with the basics. Seeds, nuts, dates, and olives. Olive trees can grow even in the poor soil of the Middle East. And they figured out how to preserve the olives thousands of years ago. We have olives that are uh, pickled in lemon uh, and different herbs. We have a Moroccan kind of olive, which is just cured in a lot of salt. Briny, salty, there's some garlic and lemon in there. You can tell that they marinated and dates, which first grew near the Nile, are some of Israel's biggest fruit exports. The king of this market is out hawking a dessert called halava. Mm, amazing, the best halava in Israel. Halava is the Israeli version of a common Mideast confection. Here, it's made from a dense base of sesame paste and sugar. And then they'll add the other element, whether it's the pistachio, the cinnamon, the chocolate, the cappuccino, to give it a slightly different flavor. It tastes like sesame, but sweet, very sweet. And in a back quarter of the market, they're still baking the same breads they have for millennia. Lafa and pita, sold to stands making Jerusalem's most iconic street foods. Shawarma, kebabs, 
and falafel. Every ethnic group makes its own versions of falafel, but they're all basically ground chickpeas and spices, molded into little balls and deep fried. It's so, so good, really, because also it's crispy. All of the people around the world like falafel. Kebabs also originated in the Middle East, and although many cultures have adopted them, you can't beat the real thing just outside the ancient walled city of Old Jerusalem. And at $5, the price is right. This is a part of their culture and to experience some of the country. So I think it's a good idea. And it's and also can, cheap. Yeah, exactly. Some of it you get at restaurants is the same, I think, but just overpriced. Jerusalem is the crossroads of many cultures and religions. The Arab Quarter is just inside the walls, through the nearly 500-year-old Damascus Gate. The shoot, or bazaar, is a maze of ancient alleyways, selling everything from clothing to all kinds of Middle Eastern foods, like pastries and shawarma. Shawarma is made by alternating layers of seasoned meat and fat onto a vertical skewer and slow roasting it so the fat makes it moist and tender. It's the perfect food for eating on the go, and it's habit forming. Al Ailat has specialized in chicken shawarma for 72 years. That looks really good. I'd like to order one shawarma, please. Sure, we'd like to have in pita bread or in the lafa bread, the Arabic bread. Decisions, decisions. The choice of salad toppings is endless, and it's finished with a drizzle of tahina a sesame sauce. Abed Ihafis has been cooking it all his life. It's my grandfather's restaurant. It's a burst of flavors. My mouth thanks you. <laughs> this is the best fast food in the world. I love the food very much. And that's the delicious lesson found in the ancient traditions of street food in Jerusalem. No matter where you come from or what religion you practice, it's the one thing everyone can agree on. And all around the globe, street foods are bridging cultural divides. So Hindus and Muslims can break roti together in Mumbai. The Japanese can keep up their ancient food rituals even on the go. In Hong Kong, locals can still find old world foods and drink herbal remedies at stalls in the middle of a modern metropolis. And the Bangkok Eat Streets offer a melting pot of cuisines. While in Berlin and Amsterdam, you can find natives, immigrants, and tourists lining up to taste the best of all worlds at great prices, keeping alive the tradition of street foods around the globe.